Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, well, that the topic of the uh, presentation is uh, uh, something I, I was uh, encouraged to do. Um, uh, and uh, as you may know, uh, Groovy 2.5 when came out just yesterday. A uh, bunch of new features and fixes, uh, the uh, macro functions and all that. A lot of work has gone into that. I think the committers have gone a, done a, a great job. Tomorrow morning, uh, Paul King will also be presenting um, all the new stuff in there. But today I'd like to talk about where we're going with uh, Groovy 3.0 um, and why we need to get there. And uh, first of all, I'll give an overview of the situation as I see it uh, right now. Then I'll try to go through the main themes of uh, making Groovy 3.0 and what we need to break underway. And then at the end, I'd like to discuss some of the hurdles and obstacles in getting there, because it's not, it's not a, a, a totally walk in the park uh, kind of situation. Um, so who am I to give this presentation? Well, first of all, I'm a huge Groovy fan. So and I'm, a, I'm an avid uh, <laughs> Grails user. Uh, I'm a partner at Nine uh, here in Denmark, and we do a lot of our best work in uh, Groovy and, and Grails. We also do other great stuff, but um, I work as a software development and an uh, application architect and a development team lead. And I've been an open source contributor for more than 20 years. Um, apart from that, I'm a father of four, and I wish every day had a bit more hours in it. I don't know if you know that. And Another very important disclaimer is this, that, oh, I copied that from an Oracle slide, sorry. But no, the real disclaimer is that although I'm calling this uh, moving forward to 3.0, and uh, I know that there's an alpha release out that is already uh, previewing some of the um, interesting stuff. You download that and play with it already. Um, this, this Things are moving, things are fluid, and uh, I don't know what 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 there will be exactly in a Groovy 3.0 uh, or when it will be exactly. Um, and also there's another quite important fact here that I, I'm not calling the shots. So so I'm just uh, spectating and, and um, uh, contributing. So the Groovy maintainers are... Excuse me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I <laughs> that, that could very... Uh, uh, that, that could easily be... So, um, but the Groovy maintainers, they're uh, busy people too, and they probably also wish that the, that they had more hours than 24, 25 sometimes. Um, so, uh, from, from here on, I'd like to give a little historical background. Um, just, yeah. Like, we're way back, 95, Java begins. 2003, I guess, the official Groovy begins, and it's obviously a Groovy solution to things. And uh, about 2008, uh, Java have been you know, struggling with getting generics out the door and, and building a huge user community, and it's starting seeing some counseling for its uh, Lambda Envy at the time. <laughs> the, um, I remember at the uh, Java 1 in 2008, yes, now they're working on it. And in 2010, they were supposedly just around the corner. The meanwhile, Groovy is, uh, is, is actually then, in that period of time, uh, picking up some of the, um, the, the hallmarks of Java, like, uh, like static compilation. So it, you know, it's becoming a, a stronger language and, and uh, moving into Java's turf. In 2012, now the lambdas and the modules are just around the corner. Uh, but should we be, be fair here and say that uh, Groovy had uh, generics like three years in the making? So it only came out in uh, December 7, whereas Java 5 was like three years pr prior to that. So, um, But I'll just interrupt myself here, because uh, when I was young and impressionable, I studied computer science uh, at the University of Copenhagen here in Denmark. and. Sometimes, when I work as a consultant, it seems like all I do is basically shuffle data from one field to another, maybe from one service to another, maybe into a database and onto another database. And, and uh, sometimes I get technical things like maybe transcoding character types and stuff like that, because that's where the bugs are. Uh, and if I'm really lucky, maybe I get to add a few numbers. Um, <laughs> 
But, you know, the mind wanders using, uh, during the daytime. So, uh, and, and with my computer science background, it, it wanders to compilers and semantics and stuff like that. And uh, in 2012, I got involved with uh, the Eclipse uh, Java compiler uh, that were, at that time, not too busy working on those lambdas. So, um, the, uh, the Dragon Book uh, actually was the slippery slope that's that led to, to this rather antiquated Eclipse compiler. Um, now, Java has all kinds of horrible semantics, and, and we shouldn't be uh, going too deep into those because uh, the like the uh, type inference is uh, like yeah you go crazy if you look look at too hard. But um, then by accident in 2013 I was invited to the Great Conf uh, speakers dinner because we were um, uh, we were uh, uh, sponsors at the time and I got to uh, talking to some interesting people and uh, hearing about the state of uh, of Groovy. And um, the cam conference came and went, and, and uh, I got busy elsewhere. And then 2014, uh, Pavel Dionisov uh, did a new Groovy partner, uh, parser in Antler 4 as a Groovy Summer of Code project. And I was became aware of that in, uh, in 2015 when I attended RayConf. And we got talking about that the, the, the the parser of Groovy was, um, you well, it was like it was getting uh, dusty. Should we say that? Because it was built on a modified Java uh, grammar for Antler 2, and it had a lot of um, well uh, things that weren't working too far, too too, too well in it, uh, and it was hard to change. I mean, it did work fine, but it was hard to change. It was ch hard to implement new language features. So um, I picked that up, the, the Google Summer of Code um, work, and then uh, I just, well, that was in 2016, I picked that up and started uh, working with it and updating it so that it got traits and stuff like that. And then out of the blue, no pun intended, uh, Daniel Sun from China uh, joined me and said, hey, I want to work on this too. And, and we were just working uh, at my fork of, of the, the Groovy. Uh, and luckily he did that because he's much more energetic than I am. So uh, what I did was I actually uh, asked him to, to join us here at GreatConf, and he couldn't attend personally. So, um, oh sorry, that was the, the slippery slope. That was where it kind of ended. So <laughs> obviously with uh, the, the brood uh, beers there. So um, I asked, I got uh, Daniel to, uh, to, to uh, talk about how, how he uh, got into this and... and uh, uh, and how that happened, because he's a very big part of uh, getting Groovy working. Hello everyone, my name is Sunan. You can call me Daniel as well. I have studied Groovy... Is the sound alright for everybody? Okay. Groovy scenes. Hello everyone, my name is Sunan. You can call me Daniel as well. I have studied Groovy since the end of 2006. In the past years, Groovy syntax has not evolved anymore. It cannot be comfortable with Java syntax. Many Java codes cannot be copied and passed and run successfully. In order to fill the gap, I worked with Jasper to continue the enter for parser project from Google Summer of Code, which was dead for a long time. While we maintained the legacy codes, we found it very hard to continue. The parser project was dead again. At last, I decided to write a brand new person from scratch and named it as Parrot. I don't know about you, but whenever I hear about something that's dead and then named Parrot, my, it, it, I, it, I just can't help it. <laughs> I can't help it. Uh, there's just that thing about Parrots. Um, but, I mean, yeah, we did try to get the Google Summer of Code thing to live. Um, 
it was very clean room implementation. It, they, he had actually started uh, with the uh, language specification and, and, and operator documentation from the website. And that actually was quite different from what's actually inside the parser. But so it was uh, actually uh, a better approach, as, um, as Daniel did, than to go back to uh, a Java parser and then add all the groovy stuff in there and then build a groovy AST instead of building a, a Java AST. So, uh, so this, this new parrot is not dead at all, I can assure you that. It may not be in a Norwegian blue. But why is it called parrot? Which means the new parser tries to learn how to speak groovy language from the old parser. Right. So the continued history is that 2014, uh, Java was released with Lambdas. And uh, so what, Groovy? Because you don't have Landis. You're changing a little bit more. And then um, Java 9 came out last year, and uh, Java 10 this year, and we'll have a Java 11 this year too, as it looks like uh, Oracle's actually uh, on, on schedule with things, by just adding very few things, obviously. But still, they're, they're releasing it, so it's, uh, it's going that direction. So. What is it about uh, Groovy and Java compatibility? Because, you know, we don't like to talk about it, but everybody does it. Everybody, you know, sees some little piece of snippet of code that works with whatever library that we need to implement, however way we've moved stuff from one field to another. And then we paste it into a Groovy program, and then suddenly you get all kinds of you know, little squiggly lines that think that's not a groovy construct. Oh, that's right, I need to fix that. Um, because, yeah, you want to write groovy, but at the same time, we live in a Java ecosystem, and the, uh, the slippery slope that leads us away from uh, Java into groovy land is, well, still starts with Java for a lot of uh, people. Can I get a show of hands here about who uses both Java and groovy on a regular basis? Thank you. Um, so Daniel also uh, has that opinion, and uh, that's many that's new features have been added, such as lambda, meta reference, construct reference, try with resource, and so on. While developing the new parser, I got many help from Groovy core team. Especially Johan and the Paul. Right. So um, the uh, Java Lambda syntax was chosen from. Uh, I don't think it mimicked anything exactly in particular, uh, but I mean there was a lot of choose to choose from at that point because you know Groovy had one way of doing things: Scala, C Sharp, Haskell. A, lo a lot of languages, um, and as you might know, it uh, ended up with this uh, this syntax here. That uh, it basically, it's a parenthesis um, uh, for the uh, for for the um, the parameters of the of the lambda, and then an arrow, and then either an expression or a block. And there, and then you can leave out the types or you can leave out the um, the uh, uh, parameters if you don't have any parameters if you just have a single parameter there's uh, you can leave out the parentheses so it's like basically four different variations of, of how to write things and it's uh, it's not compatible with I guess anything um, also soon they're in Java 11 they're adding the var keyword which is not a real keyword uh, into the type uh, of um, of the lambdas as well, but it's uh, it's not it's, there's no difference in what it means. It's, it means exactly the same as this one up here. So, but I mean, we should be happy they chose the same arrow as we had. So it, it's like um, if you're familiar with uh, with the with the, uh, the 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 80s movie. I mean, as Cleo McDowell says, they got the golden arches. Mine is the Golden Arcs. They got the Big Mac, I got the Big Mick. 
So uh, have you gotten used to writing Java 8 closures at this point? Those of you who, sorry, Java 8 lambdas, sorry. OK, some of you have. Um, I want to put in a, a short puzzler. It's not that you can win a t-shirt or anything, but um, uh, what's this thing here? I know you showed it just before. Hold on. Can you, anybody can give me the name of the, that construct? Oh, sorry, every, can anybody give me the language of that construct? Well, excuse me? It's Groovy, that's correct. And the name of the construct? It's, uh, yeah, it's actually called the method pointer in the uh, document, but, but it's the same thing. It, it's, it's, it constructs a, g a closure that, um, that calls uh, a method on an object that's p handed into it. So it, it, it's, uh, in this case, it's a, it's a function of string to string, or a closure taking a string and leaving, uh, accepting a string. How about this one? That's Java, that's right. And it's called a constructor reference, yeah. Um, so has anybody has, has anybody seen this? It's, it's a very uh, newish, newish um, construct. Came out last year, I guess. Excuse me? So it's, not Java 7. it's not Java 7. It's Java 9, right? And it's, uh, it's basically the... Uh, the try with resources, but without initialization. So basically, that, sen that statement there just closes my stream. Um, so uh, we have this one. I, I'm, I mean, you guys are pretty uh, good people. I'm sure one of you has actually used this in actual code. Which language is this? That's Java, that's right. It's not in Groovy. It's so, uh, but and what's the name of that construct? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I think they call it the placement new operator. But it's uh, it's it's how to construct the uh, the an, an inner class of in this case it's an inner class called something that we're constructing in an object called other that is hopefully the outer uh, class for that uh, that thing. It, it blew my mind actually when I I uh, got involved with a uh, Java compiler. I'd <laughs> I'd never even uh, I didn't know it was there, but but the thing is that that yeah we Java has a different uh, thing for this and this one didn't exist in Groovy uh, I guess did it No I don't think it did. Um, excuse me. Okay. So. Um, uh, Daniel has been working on um, Java compatibility where applicable. So things like uh, uh, old school do while loops, they didn't have that in Java, it, and, and it doesn't break anything to introduce it, it just makes a, new, a little subset of, uh, of code uh, possible. Array initializers, sometimes some of that copy-pasted code uh, has those, and, and it's pretty clear what it does. Yes, there's a, a, a Groovy alternative. We should probably uh, tell people to um, go and add that in their uh, code narc, whatever settings. But the, um, the thing is that you can do this without breaking anything. Uh, block structures, you can do that without breaking anything if, if you just make sure that you don't confuse it with a, with a closure. The compiler can see through that. Um, We've also, or he's also, uh, improved consistency in the, in the uh, initializers and the for loops. Um, and then there's a, f a few, um, the newer Java stuff has been uh, included in, uh, in, in Groovy 3. Uh, Lambda expressions, they basically compile to uh, closures with closure semantics. The same thing with method references, like we saw before, uh, or didn't see before actually, and constructor references. So they, they retain the, the groovy um, uh, semantics so that the, th the stuff you can do for uh, functional groovy, whatever, you, you can still do that even though it looks a bit like Java. So I, I think that's the, the a, a good approach of uh, um, embracing and extending the Java syntax. It's like that, that's, that's how groovy was built. Um, interface default methods 
also are implemented as traits. And finally, there's a try with resources, both with the, uh, the Java 7 um, and the Java 9 uh, variations, and with the typical Groovy-isms, such as you don't, if you have multiple resources, you don't need a, a, a semicolon between. You can just write it out as, as you want. And finally, uh, annotations everywhere. It's one of those uh, smaller changes, but that's a really, really troublesome thing to add into a compiler that you can have um, annotations on, on like the part of uh, within a, uh, a generic type but definition and, and, and t type parameters. You can have add annotations everywhere. And uh, judging by the direction of stuff like Micronaut and, and then, well, annotations aren't going away and the AST needs it and, and the, uh, we, we need it and we need to be um, compatible. So there's new groovy stuff too that's been added. Uh, safer operators, um, basically for consistency. So let's say you have a, like a collection or an array, and and you're not sure if it's it could be null, and, and you still want the uh, the eighteenth element. So you can do this uh, now. And and there are other examples of um, uh, basically safe of the safe operator uh, being applied where it like just didn't, um, there was a combination of things where you didn't like, like safe operator of uh, fields or safe operators for uh, method references, uh, or sorry, pointers. Um, and there's a safe Elvis uh, assignment. So, the, so it's like an Elvis assignment. If maybe is um, something that's not groovy false, then it uh, becomes no. But if it was already set to something, it doesn't need. So it's like an assignment in one, the same as maybe equals maybe Elvis, no. And um, there are also smaller um, improvements, like uh, like if something is not in a list, then, you know, in current Groovy, you'd have to add uh, a parenthesis and have that not number in the list, whatever. And the same for instance of. and. Um, I'm maybe this could be a little bit more controversial, but uh, instead of using is, which is object identity, um, not to be confused with double equals, which is obviously e the equals method, then then that that stands for uh, the is um, uh, method. So so you basically have this and also the opposite, uh, which is nice to see if okay th I mean object identity. This is important, but uh, I mean it's. You just have to look at JavaScript for uh, for a few minutes to to realize that yet you need to be careful with how you treat um, equals. So uh, Daniel has a few words to add about that. There are many difficulties to develop the new parser. For example, one, the new parser must generate identical AST with the old one does. Every properties of AST node should have same value. Sometimes bugs of the old processor were found. Then I tried to fix them in the new processor. Yes. Two. Groovy language contains some ambiguities in its grammar, mainly caused by the optional parentheses. Groovy language is very expressive as a result it's a bit ambiguous. I have to resolve how to build the parse tree and the AST for ambiguous codes. Right, but I said the uh, the, the uh, actual code of the parser is getting better. Uh, it's getting a lot more um, easy to basically understand. This is an example of how to parse uh, if then else in the Groovy 2.x, and uh, it has options in the middle. It has explicit look ahead um, uh, productions, and it it's it's kind of hard to to read. 
and this is what it looks like in, uh, in the new parser. So it's because it's uh, it's a newer version of Antler, it's Antler 4. It's a lot simpler to uh, to arrange the the uh, expressions of the parser into uh, something that you know is easier to, to read, easier to change. Um, but I think that's enough about the parser. Do you have any questions about changing a parser? Okay. Now the next theme, uh, I may uh, it it. <laughs> this is a trigger warning. I mean, some you you could get kind of about this. We're talking modules. <laughs> I warned you. So uh, basically, um, the modules system of Java has uh, it has been launched, and um, is uh, anybody here actually using modules in their Java modules in their uh, development? Show of hands. That was none. Um, but. It's. I mean, it, it's probably only a question of time when these things are going to be mandatory. I mean, at, this, at the moment we have a module path and we have a class path, and maybe at some point one will go away, or uh, when when more uh, of the server products or whatever uh, start supporting it, um, it might become it might go that that direction. So uh, the jigsaw is, is upon us. Is not universally loved. Um, actually, uh, Stephen Coburn did a, a very good uh, blog entry just last month, I think it was, about what the Java module uh, system means for uh, for language and or, or actually for library designers. But um, a, a th the same applies uh, to Groovy. Uh, basically, that um, you need to support Java 8, but you also need to support Java 9, and you can't do that un unless you put a, a pro proper module info out. But it's kind of a sticky situation. But, and there's another thing that Groovy already has modules. Because we have these sub projects with XML and, 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 and Swing and whatever. Um, so, what happened to those? Yeah, that's a problem with the jigsaw. You know, people get hurt. Um, well, the thing about that is that, well, yeah, there's a situation with two different kinds of, uh, of, of jar files now. Um, and uh, it's not s it's not certain that we can use the same kind of file for uh, for both uh, places. For that, you need to basically to have something that's compiled both for Java 8 or, or before Java 9, and but still have the module information for Java 9. Otherwise, we will have to to uh, distribute uh, different jar files for different Java versions, and and that's not nice. So that's going to take some build tricks. Uh, some of those build tricks have been implemented in the Maven. I'm not sure about uh, Gradle at this point. Probably not. And then we have something called Groovy All, which is uh, all of it. And uh, at the moment, it can uh, work as an auto module. Um, but uh, it could be that that that. Uh, sorry, actually, before I talk about this, there's another very um, disturbing things about JPMS is that it has it doesn't support split packages, so that if if we have a package with a name, it can only be in one module. You cannot have a different module that has some classes of that same uh, package name, uh, and uh, and that's a problem because I mean the the modules that um, that Groovy already has uses that extensively, so things will have to move. And now for people who aren't interested in JPMS. Um, that means that we could do something to have like a compatibility library that would basically fill the holes of those classes that need to move. And we could in include that in Groovy All and it, people wouldn't have to change uh, a lot of their code. Or maybe not even recompile. So that's what I mean, that, that we could do that, have some uh, compatibility um, shims there. So let's take a look at a, an example, a Groovy XML um, a module. It has, uh, for instance, Groovy Util XML Slurper, uh, and a lot of code uses that. And uh, it also has uh, actual packages where uh, XML Slurper could have lived, and uh, we'll need to, to move the XML Slurper to yeah, some package that doesn't exist elsewhere, because I can tell you that Groovy Util is also part of the core. So. You, you can't have it both ways. Um, 
And then, as I said, we could, we could uh, simply provide a, a compatibility version of XML Slurper that extended the real, now new XML Slurper um, and put that in Groovy or, or in Groovy Compat or whatever you could call it. And, and that would work for uh, non-JPMS, uh, including a binary compatibility, if done right. Um, but the build will need tricks, and uh, the all module, uh, or somewhere else, or compatibility module, would, would uh, need to, uh, to carry all those bridges. And, um, and, and maybe some in classes in the middle that aren't visible, but some people use it, might also have to move, and I'm not sure whether, uh, which ones are actually public API. So, so maybe some of them, may maybe you're, you're, uh, if you're doing non-standard stuff, your, your code might break. Um, so, if we're, if we're splitting up things, an additional idea uh, could be in these new times of uh, microservices and stuff like that, wouldn't it be possible to actually split the, the parser side of things and the script support from the uh, Groovy runtime? And um, that's just something I said, well, it could be worth playing with because I'm, I've seen now two uh, Micronaut presentations that saying, yeah, 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 and we have this very small runtime, unless obviously it's in Groovy because then it becomes twice, quite twice as big. If we don't need to compile code, there's lots of cl classes that, that we don't need to ship into a runtime. And if we're doing splits anyway, and things have to move, I don't know. It's, it could be worth considering. I don't know how much it would uh, say would be, but um, that's, that's uh, just an idea. Um, yeah, that, sorry, that was, that was there. And another thing is that, that uh, when things move, we could quite easily make an API scanner for people to use, because obviously um, we, we don't know all the code that's being used in, uh, in proprietary uh, solutions all over the place, but, but I mean, having an API scanner basically saying that, okay, these, these classes are going to move was something that would give an, a people an indication of how big a switch would it be to switch to Java, uh, to, to Groovy 3.0. All right, and any questions? Let's take the next theme, and that's the MOP, the Meta Object Protocol. As you know, probably, if you write this uh, piece of, uh, of Groovy code and you, you have some object and you do call some method on it, and Groovy actually does something different. It doesn't exactly do this, but essentially it asks the, the meta class to handle the invocation of the uh, requested um, uh, method name using the uh, parameters as in an array that, that you can work with. And so um, uh, for, for static uh, compilation, obviously uh, it doesn't do that. It just calls the, uh, uh, the method. Um, That allows you to change semantics of running code and and uh, and other things. Uh, for uh, to 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 work in the um, oops, to work uh, with uh, the module system, there are some things that 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 we need. There are required changes because we need to move to um, to uh, dynamic uh, invoke dynamic to be able to actually carry the lookup object from the, the client code compiled on the Groovy compiler to make that lookup available to the Groovy runtime so that it can find the proper method to call as if it was the calling class. Because the way that, that the current um, uh, call side caching is working right now, it, it can't do that. It doesn't have the, uh, the proper authorities if the module checks are, uh, are used. Obviously, if you don't use the module system, yeah, you can, you can still run the code as, as it is now. Um, and we'll also be uh, uh, limited somewhat in uh, which uh, private methods we can call. Uh, oh, Jochen knows way much more about this than I do, obviously. <laughs> and so those are the, the, the required. Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't resist when you had the dog. Uh, that's the required changes of the API. But you also have some desired changes that has been uh, described also in the past. 
I mean, I have a cleaner API, the, the ability to scope changes uh, to uh, meta classes uh, better, and uh, to keep them uh, immutable, and then basically say, well, you can you can make meta class changes, but only like in, in certain um, realms, as as they were called. But the uh, the big issue here is that that it's it's a lot of work, and um, I'm not sure how these things are going to be prioritized. Um, because basically, I, I get the idea that the, uh, the the module system is something that we need to address um, if we uh, if we want Groovy to to stay relevant um, in in all of the Java ecosystem. So, uh, any questions regarding you know basically the amount of work that needs to be done? I'll take the next theme, um, and that's something that's, uh, that, that I've been interesting uh, in for, for well, since, since Java got their lambdas. It's like, uh, can we do something to make the closures of, uh, of, of Groovy leaner and meaner? And uh, I think we do. Let's take an example here, and this is using the, uh, the Java Stream API, obviously. Uh, let's try to, to see, uh, let's try to count objects here. What we have is, um, Basically, this, uh, this we have a stream and uh, it constructs a stream from from uh, numbers and and I don't want to count those objects because that's just a placeholder for you know some piece of uh, actual work being done. But here we try to call the filter method and then the the count method of that uh, long stream, and we pass it a closure here, um, which is uh, used to yeah see if there are any. Uh, um, uh, even numbers in the um, in the stream. Um, this will generate a closure at compile time, and that closure will have a, a do call method that that does the actual work. But then it will be to 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 pass it into the filter object, which takes a, a long predicate. It will make a um, a, a Java proxy that. Uh, Delegates work to an uh, invocation handler, which is uh, in this case a c uh, converted closure by the Java, uh, sorry, by the Groovy runtime, and that converted closure then calls into the uh, the closure class. Let's uh, look at it as a stack trace. But first, this I think actually is already fixed in in uh, Groovy three, and in, in for for, uh, for a static compilation in Groovy two, I had to put the long there to make it the right class. Otherwise, it would it wouldn't know what n was, but obviously, it can take the uh, the the, uh, the type from from the filter call or from from the from the uh, the target of that that call. So the stack here. Uh, this is uh, this has been much much reduced because there is a dynamic call here, um, but basically, this is the stream API, and uh, it's it's long, but it's probably. Uh, um, pretty well optimized, and uh, a lot of it is, I mean, the inner loops uh, are there. That's just basically um, the result of setting up the, the working pipeline. And then this is the groovy part. Um, the uh, stream calls a test on this uh, proxy that I mentioned before. The proxy uh, delegates to the conversion handler, which calls into the, the meat of actually calling the um, the closure that ha that ends up in the call method of the closure, because um, the uh, converted closure doesn't know about the type of the interface that it's uh, well it does, but it, it doesn't know how to to match that up with with the actual R code here. Uh, but the Groovy dynamic runtime does that, and and there are like I don't know seven stack frames between here and here. So uh, so you get one object. And with a with a, a class which is um, cached, uh, I have this. Basically, the stream API calls this uh, dynamic um, uh, proxy that calls a converted closure, which is also instantiated for this invocation, which calls the uh, the closure itself, which is also instantiated. So um, that's a lot of objects, and because this is a dynamic call, actually. It's even worse because each of those individual longs have to be boxed and unboxed. So um, it's it's uh, something to 
consider if you want to have, you know, work with uh, bigger pieces of data and, and uh, want to use uh, uh, functional interfaces. So I'm suggesting that we have, um, that, that, that we uh, merge the implementation of the closure and the desired functional interface directly so that we can keep the semantics of the closure contract. We can still do all the things that, that Paul showed in the uh, presentation in the last hour, but we add a bridge method so that I the, the uh, actual closure object still implements the functional interface um, as, as found out by the, uh, by the compiler. Obviously, if you if you do add memoized or whatever, yes, you you lose that capability. But still, in the there is a it, it's an optimization that that doesn't really cost anything in that respect. So for static Ruby, um, we'll be able to pass the interface directly to the target, and it should be as fast as Java, and with as low memory overhead, more or less. For dynamic groovy, groovy, it will also be an improvement because the dy dynamic groovy might know which method is being called, so it might know which, um, I mean at compile time, and it might know which uh, functional interface that's referring to, so it can generate the bridge method if it wants to. Um, and then at runtime, we'd still have the dynamic invocation, but it would directly uh, see that the, uh, the object being passed in is actually of the right type, so it saves the, uh, the work of uh, creating a dynamic proxy. So also what we could do is to move the closure code itself into a hidden module of the owning class, because then we would, wouldn't have to generate all those class files. Uh, in normal applications, there are more closure class files than, than there are class class files, and each of those have a weight that's uh, distributed. Um, and uh, yes, it needs to be loaded anyway, true, because the uh, the alternative, obviously, is to load a class at runtime, but uh, sorry, to, to, to define a class at runtime, like Java does for its uh, Lambda Meta Factory. But I still think it's, uh, it's something worth considering, because it might also, uh, I mean, I haven't done any calculations, uh, sorry, for, for the uh, runtime uh, memory usage, but it cannot be greater than the, the current model, I think. And yes, and there, then there are certain extra things that we could do. Um, basically, see if we can dehydrate the, 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 the closure class a little bit and see if, if, the, if the code doesn't need a delegate or doesn't need the owner. Um, then, then we could might be able to, to save those fields, just have the method handled, pointing back to, to the implementing uh, method on the owner. And, and for uh, in Java, for stateless uh, Lambda, they, they just create one object, not one every time it's used, and uh, we could do that as well. But those are like extra credits, I think, avoiding all those interim objects and, and the uh, uh, dynamic calls, that would be a great win. So, if we do the, the count again, we can get rid of these, basically. So the closure would implement the test method directly and call your code. But just by bridge version uh, or, 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 uh, or something. And I mean, the, the, the key point here is that this co code could be inlined very effectively by the runtime. Um, any questions about about this, or I mean, okay. So how are we going to get there? Well, it's un unclear. How much must break? We're talking uh, Java 8 to be a minimum requirement because uh, I don't think I don't think it's controversial, but it's a breaking change. Uh, we need to break binary compatibility to be able to support uh, the module system. Um, we could still be compatible with uh, any Jav, uh, Groovy 2.0 code or 2.x, which had indie compilation, if we just keep the same bootstrap methods. We should um, try to keep most uh, source code compatibility uh, unharmed, but uh, if things move, then we might have to, to break that. It's not too big a change, but it needs to, to change. Um, but then legal Groovy 2.x programs should still be legal Groovy 3.x programs. 
I think. I'd like to, uh, to, to end with a word from, uh, from Daniel. Three, new features should not break the, the existing code. For example, Lambda's Azure has been used by Crozier. I must resolve the priority issue of passing. At last, I'm very glad that Jasper has posted the parent person to Java 7. So we can try it when we use Groovy 2.6 plus. Thank you, Jasper. That's all. Thank you. I think we should give uh, Daniel a great round of applause, although he's not here, because he's done so much. So some help is wanted, and uh, some of it requires like uh, uh, bytecode um, skills uh, or uh, JPMS knowledge or uh, Gradle foo, and these people are hard to find. But we also need other things. We need like uh, suitable benchmarks for uh, for break changing things. Like we need to to measure things, and some of those benchmarks should cover uh, functional interfaces and uh, the stream APIs because that's what people are also also going to be using. Um, we need to have uh, realistic code snippets to test all those uh, static uh, inference um, cases. We need to uh, have people try out the compiler on their own projects, so it needs to be simple to, to, to get started with. Um, we need people to uh, copy-paste uh, Java from Stack Overflow to see how it works in Groovy. <coughs> and we need also people uh, who can go through the, uh, the sub project and find out how we should move classes around and 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 I mean it's not all of those tasks actually require a lot of of uh, experience with uh, with uh, the groovy runtime or or, or something it, it's uh, we can cut out chunks of work that are more suitable for new people um, just the other day there was somebody uh, asking how do I find uh, tasks that are good for a beginner, and uh, luckily he got a response real quick. So um, uh, I guess we can make up um, some laundry list for for people to to work with. Well, that's uh, that. That's what I wanted to say about uh, Groovy 3.0, uh, so to speak. My main interest in at the moment is uh, in the uh, 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 closure um, code generation side of things, because you also need to be careful because the uh, the closure uh, AST is available at compile time, and you don't want to break AST compilations either. Oh, I think I forgot to mention the. Um, uh, the the language changes um, uh, where were they there? Not a single AST tree was uh, was harmed in the creation of those. <laughs> as, as at least as far as I'm uh, uh, aware, maybe this one, uh, may maybe that one because it's new. But but uh, the other ones are are made backwards compatible, so they don't break stuff that hasn't heard about these constructs. That was uh, what I wanted to say. Thank you for listening.